Okay, let me. Okay, go ahead. Just start from here. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is my my pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce to you Dr. Father Alfred Choffey, who's going to talk about as a continuation to our series of lectures that uh, we started off last week, right? Um, discussing a top, two important topics like bioethics and critical thinking. So, Father Choffey, you got the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you and welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to minimize the tile here to the bottom, so it's kind of out of the way. I always like to begin my uh, talks with a little prayer. So, O Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated. You shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask from all of you a little favor. If you see a chat uh, popping up, let me know, please. All right. I appreciate that. So uh, my background is in biology and bioethics. And uh, let me go to that right now. Just for the academic purpose, I have a uh, doctorate in uh, moral theology from the Gregorian University in Rome and a doctorate in uh, genetics from Purdue. And I've been teaching here for about 14 or 15 years, more or less. And I teach biology and bioethics. Now, the talk for today is bioethics as uh, engaging in critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And you can see that bioethics is a compound word. Many times in these topics, you get a little added value of learning a little bit of uh, Latin and Greek along the way, because uh, many modern languages are based in Latin and Latin comes from the Greek. And also this concept of um, compound words, we have part of biology and a part of ethics. And these two disciplines in principle have nothing to do with each other. Biology is an empirical science that studies organic life on earth. The only one that we know so far, the only planet so far that uh, has life for sure, all right? And ethics is one of the five branches of philosophy, which is a different discipline altogether. It's not empirical in the sense that it can't be measured not with instruments, uh, but reason is key in uh, philosophy and ethics, which is ultimately about proper or improper behavior of the human person. However, now we have a number of issues that have uh, in science, in the, in the natural sciences and the empirical science that also have an ethical dimension. Mm -hmm. So a working definition for bioethics is what may be done out of what can be done in science and technology today, right? And I always tell my students, the distinction between can and may is not just a grammatical distinction, it is a real life distinction that could mean the difference between life and death for some people. For example, we can consider issues at the beginning of human life or issues at the end of human life. We can do many things, but the question is, should we do them or not? We have little time, so we're gonna dive right into it. This is an example of um, the distinction between can and may. In 2016, NIH, uh, I presume you people know what NIH is, the National Institutes of Health, no? Okay, National Institutes of Health. There are two large federal government branches in the United States that fund research to the tune of billions of dollars every year, the annual budget, all right? One of them is NSF. How many of you have heard of NSF? NSF, okay, professors have. NIH, all right, these are the two. And NSF, National Science Foundation, it runs the non, 
clinical or non-human research generally, whereas National Institutes of Health runs the clinical or the human uh, research that is done in the United States. Mm -hmm. mm. I checked the budget back then when I was when I uh, pull up this um, this issue for 2016. The NIH budget was about 13 billion dollars for that year, one year. Okay, just to get a little grip on uh, numbers because today we throw around millions, billions, and trillions as if we're drinking a glass of water. But if we were to count to a million, one number per second, right? How long do you think it would take to count just to a million? About 12 days, day and night straight, 24 hours, 12 days to count to 1 million. To count to 1 billion, just one number per second, which you think it's kind of slow, right? Because I can say one, two, three, four, five, in less than a second. But you, when you're saying 195, uh, 23,000, then that takes longer to say. <laughs> so by average, just to make the math simple, if we were to count to a billion, uh, one number per second, it takes about 32 years straight, day and night, 24 hours a day, throughout 365 days a year. <laughs> so these numbers are large, are significant, and we throw them around like it was drinking a soda. Anyway. In 2016, the National Institutes of Health of the United States uh, proposed to relax a moratorium that there is on human animal chimera. Now, anyone know what is a chimera? No? Okay, well, a chimera is a mythological creature that is a combination between a human and a non-human. It was... Uh, a lot of Greek cultures have that, a lot of ancient cultures, and you can look them up online, is uh, animals or creatures that look human-like or animal-like. It's a mixture. Of course, they're science fiction. They don't exist, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a figment of the imagination. And yet, in science, it can be done. And this is what was being proposed to generate a human animal chimera that would have a substantial human brain in a pig and also substantial sexual organs, human sexual organs in a pig. And this is from their website. I'm just concentrating on the neurological one for now. Research in which human cells are introduced into post-gastrulation non-human mammals. So the model would be a mammal and the pig is convenient because many of the organs of the pig are similar to the human, uh, excluding rodents, where there could be substantial contribution to animal brain or substantial functional modification to animal brain. In other words, trying to generate a substantially human brain in a pig, all right? Now, let me stop there for a moment. There's currently a ban, or there was then, back in up to 2016, a ban to do this with federal money because these are federal agencies. And in 2016, the folks at NIH were proposing to relax that ban so that this could be done. In other words, to use federal money for this kind of research throughout the United States. Now, let me stop for a moment, and here is the bioethical question. Uh, how many of you think that this should be done to generate a substantially human brain in a pig or a mammal? Okay. How many think this should not be done? All right. How many are unsure and the rest don't care? Yes. Right, right. So maybe with uh, organ and tissue kind of development, like they use pig valves for a human arm. Right. Exactly. Different, different scales. Yes. Uh, okay, this part's okay. Some 
there's some kind of line like we will discuss that i'm sure there's always a line of like okay yeah, sorry. Too much. right yeah. exactly <laughs> dr yeah. tapanis is referring that there is a lot of research that is done in animals that then may be translated into clinical research, clinical trials for humans and vice versa. And the classical one is of course, pig valves for the heart precisely because the pig heart is very similar to uh, the human heart, right? In fact, there was a transplant of an entire pig heart into a human a few months ago mm -hmm. for the first time. Right. Right. For growing, yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. So exactly. So a lot of it's called xenotransplantation between human and non-human. All right. And there's a lot of research going on in there. Part of the issue is immune rejection of these organs because we identify the, the body as a foreign object and so forth. But uh, yes, you're right, there's a lot of research going there. That's why we have to stick to a specific issue and try to define it as narrowly as possible. And this is their text, right? This idea of generating a substantially human brain in a mammal that is not the rodent. And the pig was the animal of choice precisely uh, because the anatomy and physiology of the pig, more the physiology, is very similar uh, to the human. Now, uh, this, but you see, when we say we, this should not be done, or this should be done, well, what are the reasons for that? The reasons generally in bioethics come from three different fields. The reasons could be from empirical science, or they could be from philosophy or theology. So a lot depends on the audience that one is speaking to. If I'm speaking, for example, to priests and nuns, I'm going to use theological arguments because they're in tune with that and they're believers. But if I'm speaking in a secular uh, uh, or a mixed group, the arguments are going to come mostly from empirical science and philosophy, because that's something that we can all understand at a rational level without having to invoke God, faith, or religion at all. All right? Well... This ban was not relaxed. And so uh, the ban is still on, on doing human animal chimeras specifically for this. Uh, however, the research itself was done because NIH is only federal funds. And then uh, a number of uh, labs in the world thought that this was, uh, like they say, the cat is out of the bag now. And so they thought that this experiment was uh, worthwhile doing is what they call proof of concept, right? Proof of concept. So the uh, Salk Institute in La Jolla, California picked it up with donations, not federal funding, and they went ahead and did the first stage of the chimera, which was taking iPSCs. Anybody know what uh, uh, iPSCs are? These are induced pluripotent stem cells. Yamanaka and uh, his lab developed these uh, about uh, 15, 20 years ago, to take um, differentiated cells and undifferentiate them back to the pluripotent state, which is like the second stage in the embryonic development, and then redifferentiate them into a different tissue. All right. Anyway, that's the little brief background. These are in, um, induced pluripotent stem cells that are taken from a human. It could be skin cells. It could be adipose tissue and they are tweaked in the lab to undifferentiate, and then they are inserted with a uh, glass cannula that is pretty much a very thin needle, glass needle, into the blastocyst, which is the third stage of embryonic development for mammals. First there's the zygote, then there's the morula, and then the blastocyst, okay? And this is a, the diagram of it. Then that blastula is re-implanted into the pig, and taken through gestation, through the pregnancy. In fact, these are the actual photos. It's the diagram, but these are the photos. This is a little glass rod that serves as a vacuum to hold the blastocyst in place. This is the actual blastocyst here. You can see the outer layer, uh, which is known as the uh, trophectoderm or trophoblast. And then this little mass of cells here inside is called the inner cell mass for lack of imagination, 
the mass of cells inside the blastocyst is called the ICM or inner cell mass. This is what becomes the embryo proper in mammals, all right? This is what becomes the embryo proper. And the rest, this, this uh, trophectoderm here, what does this become in mammals, in normal gestation? What happens between the embryo and the uterus of the mom? What needs to establish there for nutrition and getting rid of waste? The placenta, the placenta, well, umbilical cord and placenta, right? So the outer layer becomes a placenta and the embryo is here. Tell me about chats, please. Okay, thank you. So, and here's a little cannula coming with the individual cells, the pluripotent cells. The hole has already been punctured through. And so this cannula will insert these cells, these human cells into the pig embryo. And then this blastocyst implanted into, uh, I think they're called sow, right? Is a sow, is a female pig. And here's the actual uh, fetus several weeks later. I know how, how far it went, but of course they did not take this uh, fetus to term, right? So it was uh, euthanized uh, before the full gestation period. They just wanted to prove the concept that it could be done. Now, these human cells can be uh, tagged with uh, fluorescent dyes or some other dyes. And then by examining the, the fuel body, they can tell where the cells went, in what part. I can just tell you that the technology has developed so sophisticatedly today that these cells can actually be targeted to specific organs of the body of the mammal, of the fetal or the embryo, all right, to specific organs. So obviously, if they're looking to place these human cells into a pig brain, they can, it can be done, it can be done. So that's the question. It can be done. But may it be done? Should it be done? Before you answer yourself that question, play this forward if it's done. Imagine a human waking up one day and realizing that he or she is inside a pig. Because where's the seat of consciousness? The seat of consciousness is in the brain. And so if we grow a substantially human brain in a pig, it could be there's a potential for that human brain to start thinking like a human and realizing they're inside the body of a pig. Now, there should be something that is revolting about that in humanity, that that is a cruelty to that human that was in there, right? And we should not do that. So you see the arguments come from philosophy and science of what can be done and what may be done, what should be done. So that's bioethics. And I say it's job security because there's always a bioethical issue coming up. It's driven by technology today. What used to be science fiction a few years ago is now becoming a reality as you can see it, right? In fact, there's actually a movie about this. You may have seen it, The Island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> there has been a remake of that movie also. Uh, this Dr. Moreau went to this island and started making these cameras, which then got wild and the whole thing went south, as they say. Uh, yes, Professor Voltaire. Um, so I'm wondering, is there really a problem? Because you wake up and you're in the body of a pig, you've always been a pig. So where's the human part? Well, anatomically and physiologically, up until the consciousness, right? But a human in a pig cannot do what humans do. First of all, they're tetrapods, they have to walk on all four legs. So the four legs, the four arms are not available, the hands are not available. And we have a lot of hand, brain, motor uh, coordination and manipulation. So that human in a pig would not be able to uh, write or do any of the technology that we do with our hands, for example. That's just one thing that comes to mind, right? Do we have a right to it? Does that, does that human have a right to speak to other humans, for example? It's got a pig vocal cord. So when denying that person the speech, the human speech. Yeah. Right. 
Right. Okay. Yep. A chimera, exactly. It's going to be a really, really hard pig, maybe more emotional. It's not a pig anymore. It's a chimera. Like a pig anymore. Like a treat to pigs, like well, something else. Maybe kind of like how we treat maybe um chimpanzees or research animals. That that's a pig now with uh with an enhanced consciousness to some point, to whatever point we don't know yet, because it's it's not yeah. truly human, it's it had definitely pigs yeah. cells in it. But I thought of it more in that way, that that's it's not really yeah. a pig anymore. Now it's you know, a chimera and it right. has other problems, you know? Right, of course. Well, uh, the whole effort for this is uh, part of that human uh, brain project that is going on, just like the human genome project went on from the 90s until 2000 to decipher the entire human genome. Now there's a human brain project going on for several years and to try to find out everything possible about the brain, all the way from the biochemical and the molecular structure, all the way to the highest uh, order of thought, abstract thought, and so forth, and even creativity. And uh, this project, of course, involves research in the human brain, but that involves also consent, because the human brain belongs to a human being, and the human being needs to consent. Uh, we're not going to do experiments without the consent of the, of the patient or the individual. So this theoretically would bypass consent, because if it's in a pig, then they don't need consent from the pig, right? <laughs> So that's the whole thing behind it, right? But uh, what I try to point out is that there are things that can be done today in science and technology, but that they shouldn't be done. And with regards to the question of suffering that we left it kind of up in the air, it's not just because the individual may or may not suffer. Think of someone who may be, for example, in, in jail uh, uh, for a crime they haven't committed. It's an injustice, but they're not necessarily suffering as such. They may or may not be suffering. It's it's independent of whether there's suffering involved. We're talking about like fundamental human rights, you know, that a human brain belongs to a, to a human body, to a human being. And this is what is known as fundamental human rights. It goes back to the experiments that were done uh, during the Second War uh, in the Nazi concentration camps and how the whole issue of informed consent came out of that and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights within the United Nations, et cetera. So there's a lot of background documentation for that. Yes? Not necessarily because here we're talking about, first of all, there could be consent either from the individual or from the proxy in the case of a cadaver, right? Uh, the, the classical example is a trauma to the head, a lethal trauma to the head where the person is declared brain dead precisely total brain death, but the heart is still functioning. So the next of kin could donate that heart for scientific research. But there we're talking about a, an, an organ that by itself is non-sentient. It's an organ, it's a pump essentially. Just like for example, when we put, when we put uh, patients on, uh, on a dialysis machine, the dialysis is substituted in the kidneys, it's a vital function. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet that is the clinical standard for uh, renal failure. Yes. Yes, that's one bioethical line there, and also precisely because of the consciousness, and also there is a, a line between all other organs and the reproductive organs, because the reproductive organs are not vital to the individual, but they're vital to the next generation. So, in a sense, the vital the the reproductive organs also belong one way or another to the next generation, but that's at the level of the whole population. As long as someone in the whole population is procreating, then the next generation has some assurance. Okay, let me move forward because this is not really the ethical case that I want to present. I'm just giving an example of the distinction between can and may, which is a vital distinction in bioethics. It's not just a grammatical. Hmm? I, I just wanted yes. to point out yep. that uh, it might help to know that uh, together with the definition that you provided, which is real and, and good and valid, mm -hmm. there's uh, another definition for the matter, which is or illusion, which accompanies the, the other one. Like yes, right. It's part of the functions of the brain. Yeah. 
Okay, so basically I'm just pointing out uh, the distinction between can and may. Bioethics today is actually built on two large pillars, uh, human life bioethics, of which I just gave you an example, and environmental bioethics. So I'm going to move to the environmental side for now to give you a picture of that. It turns out that mm, we're finding an increasing rate of loss of biodiversity throughout the whole world in some regions more than others. But these are two graphs that associate, at least associate and maybe even correlate uh, human population growth with extinction rate, right? Now there's a background extinction rate which has been up until the 1900s below 10,000. And there's a replacement because as we speak of extinction rate, there is also new species that are arising uh, periodically, right? And so there's a, a replacement there. But basically there's up until the 1900s, a background extinction rate, which was uh, pretty stable and flat. But since about the 1950s, it starts shooting up and you can see this is kind of the first part of a sigmoid curve. This is the log phase, which is an increase, it's a geometric increase. In, uh, it's like a duplication of numbers per time, all right? And uh, when you think of a sigmoid curve or a growth curve for any species as a growth curve until it starts limited resources start plateauing the curve. This is the first half of that curve. And that's the green on the purple is human population growth globally in millions. And see these are two scales here. This is actually getting closer to 8,000 million or 8 billion today, right? And the extinction rate is on, on this scale here. So you can see that's very close association and maybe even, like I say, statistical correlation between the two. So surprisingly for some people, what is driving most of this biodiversity laws, uh, how many would think it's um, climate change? Would think it's climate change? Some, yes. But more, more significant than climate change in the short term, in other words, the rate of extinction is actually loss of habitat. It's more crucial right now because climate change one way or another is still kind of long to middle range in time, right? Decades, hundreds of years, thousands. In fact, climate is typically measured in thousands or even millions of years, not weather, but climate. Mm -hmm. uh, so loss of habitat because the animals and plants have to live somewhere, <laughs> right? And so loss of habitat worldwide is more critical and uh, associated closely to loss of biodiversity. This is uh, one map that is showing that at the global level, the going from the uh, deeper blue color all the way to uh, dark red. Deeper blue is where there is less loss or least loss of biodiversity worldwide. You can see it's mostly two swaths. The northern, uh, you notice that most of the land mass is in the northern hemisphere of the world anyway. The equator is somewhere around here. I should have put a line on the equator, but most of the land masses are in the Northern Hemisphere. So basically, um, Alaska, Canada, and Siberia getting close to what would be the Arctic Circle up north. And then another swath here around the equator precisely because uh, that's where we have the largest biodiversity with tropical rainforests. Uh, Latin America, the Amazon Basin, here the Congo Basin in Africa, and then the Southeast uh, Polynesian Islands. There's the greatest biodiversity of plants and animals throughout the whole world, so the tropical regions. And then the hotspots for biodiversity loss are in the temperate regions, uh, North America, um, uh, Asia, and then the southern tip of Africa, Australia. This is because most of the central of Australia is a desert. It's a huge desert, very dry, and the southern part of South America, which is more densely populated. Just Buenos Aires, for example, which is the capital of Argentina, has over 10 million people. Those large cities, by the way, are called uh, megalopolis, and I'll talk about them in a minute. The big three for uh, habitat loss in, throughout the world are residential development, agriculture, and also industry, the industrial footprint where the actual factories are, right? Those are the three big ones for loss of biodiversity. And this 
is very graphic. You can see from photographs exactly how uh, these uh, areas have been carved out of natural areas. Therefore, a concept that has emerged is a concept of the urban forest, see? Because we also have to live somewhere, and not only plants and animals, we also have to live somewhere. And so the concept of the urban forest, for example, Central Park in New York, I don't know if you've ever been there, but there it is, right in the middle of the um, concrete jungle. And also Sydney has a Central Park of its own downtown. This concept of the urban forest actually goes back to about 200 years the, with the Chinese empire. The Chinese archipelago, I, I'm sorry, Japan. Japan is an archipelago that has about 13,000 islands in it, but most of the islands are uninhabited because they don't have fresh water, <laughs> okay? And they're smaller and therefore they, they, they're not inhabited by humans. But uh, Tokyo is, and uh, this concept of the urban forest was started there like I said, about 200 years ago, and this is one of the entrances to their forest. The region of, uh, the metropolitan region of Tokyo, Yokohama is right now the largest urban concentration in the world. It's about 30, 37 million people living in that area. It's a megalopoly. A megalopoly is defined as a, a metropolitan area that has uh, at least 10 million people living in it, all right? That's the cutoff. However, there is Mount Fuji at the background, right? Very prominent. Don't miss the little urban forest here embedded right in the midst of that megalopoly is their urban forest. And there seems to be another one back here in the background. Anyway, so this concept of urban forest, we can uh, bring it home because here is a tri-county region from uh, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. Mm -hmm. This region combined holds about 6 million people. So we're not too far from a megalopoly, all right? And you notice more people are moving into South Florida than leaving South Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So this is only bound to increase. You notice also from this aerial photograph that this uh, tri-county uh, metropoly is sandwiched in between two large natural areas, the Atlantic Ocean to the east and the Everglades uh, to the west which are two large natural areas and that of course uh, need to be preserved. They're very much influence our local uh, weather here in South Florida. So where is Miami Gardens uh, within this uh, Tri-County region? Is this little red and white triangle down here? There it is. Let's zoom into that for a little bit. Uh, the triangle is actually like a trapezoid, right? Got a cut off here by a canal and expressways. And so this is our Miami Gardens area uh, locally. Where is St. Thomas University within Miami Gardens? There it is, that little rectangle at the bottom. You notice it's very close to the Apalaka Airport, which has uh, major air traffic and also bounded by an expressway, the Palmetto Expressway up here, which also has commercial traffic and so forth. So the point that I'm trying to make is that this, uh, our campus is a pretty green campus. We have our slash pine forest, of course, but the rest of the campus also has quite a bit of greenery. Several years ago, we did some research measuring the ratio between green and gray area of a campus, green and gray surface, three-dimensional green and gray area. Three-dimensional means that like, the canopy of trees and the bushes and the grass right, of green area versus the gray area, in other words, built, building area. And the ratio came out to about nine to one on the green side. So at least back then, uh, this was done in uh, 2018, 2017. Back then we were a very green campus. New buildings have come up since. In fact, right now the forest is about 10% of the entire uh, 140 acres we have on campus, all right? And the forest is about 15 acres. So 10% of it is left and we're trying to preserve it for dear life. You notice that there's actually a corridor, there's a swath here of greenery going across the Palmetto Expressway and into the Northeast of Miami Gardens. So there's kind of a diagonal swath of greenery. And that's a good thing because animals can actually migrate from one 
you can think of these as islands, as uh, uh, nature, natural islands, and birds for sure, but also insects and mammals and other animals can migrate back and forth and extend their range in between the urbanicity that is all over the place, as you see, it's a residential area all over, right? And so really uh, St. Thomas Forest is only one patch of greenery that actually extends across the urban area. So that's the concept of the urban greenery, okay? So these corridors are good uh, for many reasons. Uh, here at St. Thomas, we're trying to preserve our own uh, 15 acres of the forest. Uh, you can see that it's mostly made up of a slash pine of which you have a baby pine there that you can take for free. These are a gift to you and the recipe comes inside of how to take care of it, right? And basically we have here pines and palm, right? Now for people who know a little bit about pines and palms, this photograph, this, this image, this setting should take pause and call attention to people who know a little bit about plants. And again, just using logical reasoning and what little we know about science, pines typically live where? In what kind of uh, climate? Warm or cold? Cold, right? Up north, in the fact they are adapted to survive uh, harsh winter conditions. They have needles instead of leaves, they have cones instead of flowers. So these are all structures to resist cold, harsh, freezing rain and snow and so forth. Internally, they have resin instead of sap. Sap is a white milky substance that has a lot of water content, but resin is oily, amber color, and it's thick and it doesn't freeze at, uh, in the winter. And so that's also why pines are called evergreens because they stay green during the winter. That's their leg up in growth during the winter where all the other deciduous trees lose their leaves, all right? So evergreens. Palms, on the other hand, don't tolerate any degree of cold whatsoever. You get out of Florida and you left the palms behind <laughs> because palms don't tolerate much degree of uh, cold at all, all right? They freeze and burn and die. So when you see pine and palm together, you should take note that this is a unique site. It's a rare event and it's happening naturally in our forest. One of these two guys had to adapt to a subtropical environment. And which one of the two adapted? The pine adapted. So when did it adapt? It adapted about 10 to 12,000 years ago, which was when we had the last ice age. We've had five ice ages go on, uh, on Earth, uh, on the Northern hemisphere uh, in the past half million years. And the last one receded about 10 to 12,000 years ago. The peninsula of Florida never became encrusted with ice. Now we're talking about an ice, an ice age, is uh, it's a glacier that is not you know 10 or 20 feet of ice. We're talking one to two miles of ice, one to two miles of ice above the earth, grinding back and forth like this over decades and centuries. The Great Lakes were carved out. The five Great Lakes were carved out by glaciers. <laughs> it is massive. But the peninsula never got uh, invaded by the glaciers. So many animals and plants migrated down into the peninsula over the centuries. And some of them adapted and they're here. And the pine, the slash pine is the only species that adapted and is here with us today. They adapted so well that they actually became the dominant species of South Florida. At one time, the whole peninsula was covered in slash pine up until the 1900s, where the saw got here. The saw, the, the two man saw, the, the white blade saw, you know, see it in, in uh, Western movies. One guy gets on one side of the tree, the other guy goes on the other side and they go back and forth, back and forth until the tree falls, right? That's the white blade saw. That got here about a century ago and started cutting down and using the pine for log cabin because it's also resistant to termites and boring beetles and all these other insects. Ideal wood for construction before the building code. And so now we only have about 1% left <laughs> of the slash pine in all of South Florida. And we happen to have the last remaining highland slash pine forest left in Day County, all right? And so we're trying to preserve it. Just to round it up, this is an example of some of the native species that have been found in the forest over the years. We have uh, insects, we have uh, amphibians, birds, mammals, reptiles. These are all native species that have been found in the forest at one time or another. 
and you can see the photos here. So uh, I conclude with this, that is worth preserving. We have our own little niche of biodiversity, right, in our own forest. And this is a contribution not only to Miami Gardens, but to Miami-Dade County and even the tri-county area of that whole metropolitan region. So thank you very much for your attention. This is a sunset from the second story of the Gus overlooking our forest and uh, something that is for all of us uh, to enjoy right here on our campus. Thanks again for your participation. Any questions or comments? No? There's a chat. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to the chat. Beautiful. Okay, Dr. Turan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turan. Appreciate it. We do have snakes on campus. Uh, lots of them. We have. Yep. Yes. Non non poisonous. Non poisonous. We have uh, garter snakes. We have racers. Here's a corn snake. Uh, ring snakes. Uh, they're very pretty. Uh, I love snakes. <laughs> And uh, they're not poisonous so far. We haven't found any cottonmouth or uh, rattlers in here, even though there are in South Florida, but not here. Most snakes are actually shy. And the first thing is most animals are shy and they run away from us like there's no tomorrow because we are the most dangerous species on earth. <laughs> and so an instinct tells them, run away from that bipedal creature over there. <laughs> the two-legged creature, stay away. <laughs> okay. But uh, we have foxes, we have falcons, uh, we're increasing the butterfly population because we're bringing back native species of plants. Part of the project, part of the restoration project that we're doing is uh, to get rid of the invasive species and to reintroduce native species to increase the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And so that also brings more wildlife into the area, keeping it contained within the 15 acres of the forest, which is in the northern part of campus. So we have a, an increasing number of butterflies coming into the area now that are feeding on the different uh, uh, flowers uh, that we have. Yeah. No chat, yes. Okay. Oh, new, thank you. Father, I had a question also. Okay. Yes. Yes. Question, um, you were speaking about um, keeping the area like around STU diverse and as far as like the nature and preserving it. Um, and ways to like reverse that. I know we just have like the 10 acres of the forest that's there. Um, besides the like other things that we can do to also preserve or is there a way to like reverse the um, the degradation of the biodiversity so that like besides the area around STU, like other areas that have less of the, the biodiversity so that other areas can also um, reverse the process, I'm wondering, you know? Yes, sister, thank you for your question. Yes, it's a multi-layered question, of course. Uh, we can do many things to reverse the biodiversity. I want to say this first, that nature has a built-in mechanism to restore itself in abundance, in excess. Uh, for example, this photo here is uh, from the Gus. Actually, the, the Gus building is uh, just to the right of the photo. All right, so this is what we call it the business sector. Every time we clear an area, we call it a sector. And then the building, the business building is right next to it. So this is the business sector. You see the little red flags down here. These are plant species that we have reintroduced, native plants that were locally extinct. And we are reintroducing. We're associated with Fairchild Tropical Gardens, for example, and another conservation effort, the, uh, the um, Regional Conservation um, Institute in Florida. So many different things uh, to be done. For example, to try to minimize the, the pollution that goes into an area, the contamination, right? To raise awareness, to dedicate, for example, areas. Oh, what I want to say about, because I lost the train of thought. When we cleared this area, this area was full of invasive trees, huge trees from all over the world that were here, from uh, Asia, Latin America, Africa, Australia. In, even India, uh, we clear them out and the space opened up. When we clear this area, this area has about 20 adult pines. In a few months, we went back and started looking. We found 300 baby pines, like the ones you have in front of you. 
300 of them. So what is replacement? If there are 20 adult pines in this business sector, which is kind of an oval, all right, there are 20 adult pines. What is replacement number for those 20? Let me break it down. How many children does it take to replace our two parents? Two children, right? <laughs> two children to replace two parents, two adults. Right, so that's replacement. It would take 20 pines to replace the 20 adult pines that are there. And we found 300 baby pines, 300 seedlings. At, 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 that's just on the first year of seedling. The second year will be another 300. So there's an overabundance. Nature is that way because most of the animals and plants will not make it. Like a, a fish will lay out thousands of eggs, but that fish only needs one of those eggs to survive to adulthood to replace it, <laughs> right? Or him or her. And so there's an overabundance. In fact, that was one of Darwin's uh, five observations for developing his theory of evolution, is the overabundance of progeny. Therefore, back to sister's question, if we leave an area alone by itself, it will restore, it will restore. Sometimes we may need to help, especially at the vegetation level, at the plant level, because if some species are locally extinct, right, then we have to reintroduce them and that will increase the biodiversity of the animals. So as long as we put the right plants in place, then the animals will come because the animals are looking for those plants. So you remember the first layer of animals are herbivores, the ones that are feeding on the plants, and then the carnivores or the omnivores will feed on those animals that are feeding on plants. So plants begin the whole cycle of biodiversity. And that's what we concentrate on the plant biodiversity first, and then the animals will come on their own sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Neat, elegant. So many things can be done. You can also, yep, please. Yep. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Yeah, Joe House. Yes. So folks that have to rest in it, not live in that area because there's pollution and what, whatever's going on in that area. Is exactly. If I don't care, it's a lot of people care. Exactly. The genetics of the biodiversity. Yes. Right. In fact, from the genetic perspective, uh, geneticists, we see plants and animals and fungi and bacteria as basically as gene bags. So you, we can think of ourselves as a bag of human genes that are walking around, okay? We can think of it that way and that genetic for, when we talk about fitness, we're not talking about the gym, we're talking about genetic fitness, precisely. And it's all in having diversity within the species themselves. In, in between species, but the individuals within species, because the individuals within each species, some will be more successful than others, some will be more fit than others. And selection is acting precisely on fitness, right? It's a selecting out the least fit. Mm -hmm. So this is all very uh, beautiful, very elegant. Well, we need basically space. So another thing, for example, uh, continuing on, on Sister's question, we could uh, petition the city to dedicate certain city blocks, like every so many acreage, a city block to a local park. But the park, not manicured lawn and stuff like that, let natural uh, grasses and natural vegetation grow there, and then generate trails throughout that park. See, people, we stay on the trails and we admire the nature that is around us, that is the local nature. And that doesn't require any maintenance. You see sometimes in these parks, the, um, Lawnmowers have to come in and maintain it and manicure it. But if we leave a natural place, that's a concept of the urban forest. And now they're talking about urban, just urban greenery. Um, your, your lawn could be in your house, could be just an area where natural vegetation grows and it will go with the natural cycle. You don't even need to water it because the rain will water it in its own time. Hmm? This concept of 
harmonizing living with nature, even down to the level of individual homes can be done that, that can be done. And then the animals will migrate from one place to another and keep going. Okay, any other chats? Uh, I know I'm beyond the time. But, uh... Okay, well, thank you again.